My name is Leanne Manos, and I was born to do what I do. But if you ask my younger self, that person will tell you it's impossible. There is no way that Leanne Manos is going to be on television and interviewing hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, waking up every single day for the last 20 years and not believing what I do for a living. This is me. Okay, I, I don't have blonde hair and blue eyes, but this was me. This was the Leanne that you didn't know. This was the real me, the person who would stand behind my mother, who would peer from behind her dress, who would sit in the classroom and watch everybody else get up and share their stories, stand up in front of an audience and speak to people, get up on a stage and act, and just generally talk about what they were thinking. I could never do that. I would just stand there and watch. And I'd have all these ideas and thoughts in my mind, and I'd want to say them, but there was a block. There was something stopping me and I didn't know what that was. It was something that was, it was so frustrating that I think a word to describe me was insipid. People used to call me a plain Jane. Shame, don't worry about her. She doesn't need to say anything. She's fine. But there was one person who believed something about me that I never ever believed in myself. She saw something in me that would become this person, and that was my mother. She sent me to speech and drama lessons, kicking and screaming. I hated it. The concept of going and standing and learning elocution and how to speak and how to do things like that used to kill me. But the reality was, if it wasn't for that, I would never have achieved my impossible. And I emphasize the word, my impossible, because Everybody has their impossible. It's not the impossible, it's your impossible. I am a living example of achieving my impossible. And it wasn't easy. Nothing is easy about achieving your impossible. That's why it's your impossible. It's that thing that stands in front of you. It's that thing that stops you from becoming what you believe you can be, but there's something that's stopping you and it's called the impossible. That person. You know that person? <laughs> Have you ever had one of those in your lives? So I get over myself, which is one impossible, and I kind of become very confident, and I become this amazing person who now realizes what I want to do. In fact, I even became head girl at school. Can you believe it? It was that revolutionary that I went from that little girl, the blonde, blue-eyed girl, to this one, the dark black haired girl, which is pretty cool actually, I quite like the black haired version. And I was full of confidence and suddenly I found my voice, I stood on stages, I, I started debating, I started acting, I started having this confidence and I realized I wanted to be a broadcast journalist. And then I found myself a job. It was a, a, a little job, and, and it, it, but that's how it all happens, right? You've got to find yourself a little job to create the bigger job. So I found myself a job at a radio station reporting on traffic news. And I would get the phone call, write it down, hand it to the anchor, whoever it may be, to tell them where the accident was. And then I'd work myself around. I went from there to doing producing, to call screening, to eventually writing news bulletins, and then getting the midnight shift of a reading the news, which was a great thing for me. And I loved it, and I was getting there. I was growing, I was becoming more and more and more confident in myself and my ability to reach my goal, to reach my dream, to achieve what I believed was so possible. And I was doing this for a while, and eventually I went to that person's door and knocked on it. And I said, can I chat to you for just a little bit and find out uh, a, a thing or two? And this person said, yeah, sure. Happened to be a woman, by the way. Walked in, sat down and said, I want more. I believe that I've got more. 
can you maybe send me out to a story? Can you maybe, let me, I, I don't want to stop working the midnight shift. I'm happy here. It's fine. I'm learning, but I just want to grow. Can I even maybe shadow a reporter? Can I do something? I can see all those hungry eyes in the audience now looking at me, these beautiful young, young girls and, and boys that are dreaming of their future. And that's what I looked like. And that's how I felt. I walked into this office and I stood there and I looked at her with a smile, said what I said. And she just looked at me and said, no. And I was like, what? She said, you don't have what it takes. You don't have the talent. I'm sorry, but you don't belong in broadcasting. You just are not good enough. Wow. Can you imagine this young, excitable, enthusiastic individual who had self-belief, who had worked really hard to get the self-belief and some person stood in front of me and told me that my dreams were worthless, that my belief in myself was unfounded and that I actually didn't belong anywhere near what I thought was right, but what she thought was right for me was to go and find a job doing something else. I had two choices at that time. The one choice was to walk back to the traffic desk, sit there and allow someone who had a view of me or had their own securities and projected them onto me and allow that to happen or walk back to the traffic desk, pick up my bag and walk right out the door and never ever walk back through those doors again. I don't think I need to tell you which route I took. The reality of the situation is that if you have a light that others do not, you are bound to uncover it and let it spread its beams. Don't let anybody stop you from spreading your beams. Because if you do, it is a sin. It is a cardinal sin. Look at the person next to you. Just do me a favor and look at that person. Do you look like them? Do you sound like them? Do you feel the same emotions as them? The answer is no, because every single one of us are different and every single one of us have a gift. Some of us may have a gift to be on television, but the other person's gift is to make that damn television because I wouldn't be able to be doing what I do without the next person. Understand that each one of us have different goals. Each one of us have different lights. Don't allow it not to shine. And how do you shine? You take success and you make it your fuel. You know that person I'm talking about. And even if you are that person that's telling you you can't do it, prove yourself wrong. Because I know little Leanne did not believe that big Leanne could be doing this. And damn, I wish I could go and stand in front of her in the class where she's sitting there crying because her mother didn't arrive before the bell or the bell did ring and she had to sort of watch everybody else going and she was still there and she started having a panic attack. I want to go to her and hug her and tell her it's going to be okay. Take whatever you're feeling, let it fuel you and let it bring out the best in you. Because if you don't, you'll never shine that light. And success is the best revenge to do this. Look what I've done. Look who I've spoken to. I am bragging, but I'm not bragging because I still believe, I still believe I'm dreaming. I still believe that at the end of the day, this hard work, this dream that I have of speaking to Oprah Winfrey, speaking to Nelson Mandela, walking in the footsteps of people that I look up to, admire, and, 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 and pinch myself every day that I'm still able to do this. And I have been doing it, this particular one for the last 15 years. It's because I've changed. It's because I've moved. It's because I've, I've understood this changing environment and this changing me, and I've moved with the times. But you get to a point where this becomes a thing that as wonderful as it is, it still becomes a routine and it still becomes a comfort zone. And yes, I wake up every morning 
And yes, I get out of bed and I get dressed and I get in my car and I go to work and I interview these beautiful people and interrogate them if I have to or do whatever I have to do. And then I get back in my car and I do shopping and I go home and then I pick up the kids and then I come home and I do the homework and then I see my husband. If we're lucky, we kiss each other on the way in, but nine times out of 10, you probably don't. You then drag yourself to bed and you sleep and you wake up to the alarm at four o'clock in the morning and you wake up and you go to your car. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you get the this, the routine starts and you and you slip into it and as wonderful as this is and as glorious as you think my life is it is the same as yours it is a routine and it's something that we find ourselves in it's it's a place called a comfort zone you know that place that this place where nothing grows it's lovely you're enjoying it but you're not growing and then one day someone comes to you and says to you hey do you want to climb a mountain and I'm like, yeah, of course, sure. I mean, why not? You know, I've, I've never camped. I have never camped a day in my life. I have never hiked. In fact, for me to run from here to there is a big deal. The only stars I sleep under are the five stars at the entrance of a hotel. That, that is my camping. So I get the phone call to say, um, you want to climb not only any mountain, but the highest mountain on the African continent. And I'm like, you've got the wrong number, but thank you. Thank you so much for phoning me. And I put the phone down and I phone my husband laughing. And I say to him, dude, you will never believe the phone call I got. Cello from the Nelson Mandela Foundation phoned me to ask me to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I mean, have you ever? I'm laughing and he's like, great. You put the phone down now, you phone him back and you tell him we're doing it. I said, excuse me, what did you just say? He said, no, put the phone down, we're doing it. And this just took me by surprise because my husband knows me, he's married to me, he sleeps in the same bed as me, and sometimes we even kiss each other. <laughs> Not all the time, you know, that, that place you find yourself in. But, and he's telling me I can climb a mountain. There's no way. Not in this lifetime can I climb the highest mountain in Africa. Anyway, once again, it took somebody else to recognize my ability. Not me, because I don't see it. Someone else saw it. Sometimes you have to say yes. In fact, say yes more times than you say no, because you never know what will happen. You never, ever know with hard work, with determination, with the courage of self-belief that you too can reach the top of Africa. I did it. I did. I accomplished my impossible. And you know what? I still never slept under the stars. I'm just putting it out there, hashtag. I, I, I didn't, I slept in a cabin all the way up, but that was great. So if you do go Kilimanjaro and you don't want to sleep in a tent, you can do that. You can do anything, you honestly can. In my job, one of the most beautiful things I get to do is meet people. And no, I'm not gonna talk about the famous people. I'm gonna talk about the people that have moved me more than anybody else has moved me. And those are the people that are true, that are real, that have had everything taken away from them. One of the greatest honors bestowed on me was the title of UNHCR Goodwill Ambassador, which allows me to travel to refugee camps around the world, but mostly here on the African continent is where I truly feel that we have no idea where we sit on the food chain in the world. And you will only realize that when you go into a refugee camp. You have nothing. You are no one. Imagine at this point in time right now that the army rebels come into this room and you run out of here with everything that you have on you now. Do you have your passport? Do you have your certificate of what you've studied and achieved in your life? Do you have anything? Do you have your children? The answer to that is no, you don't have anything. And you've got to run for your life to the nearest country and start afresh. You could be a doctor and people look at you as if you're no one because you're wearing the same clothes that you have been running in for hundreds upon hundreds of days to get to security. Well, this is a woman I met, her name was Martha an unbelievable woman who ran from South Sudan to find a better life in a refugee camp in Kokuma. She's been living there for years. My question to her is simple. Are you happy? I mean, how could you be happy, Martha? You have nothing. 
You sit here every single day chopping vegetables and trying to make some food out of absolutely nothing. Are you happy? Her answer, I've never been happier. Why, I ask her, because there is no gunfire, because there are no bombs. I have achieved my impossible by finding peace. That's Martha's impossible. My impossible seems to pale in comparison, doesn't it? I carry on in the refugee camp and I get to a school. Not a school that you think of when you think of a school, because even though I know in South Africa we have major problems and we really do and I'll never ever downplay them, but take the school in a little shack or a little shanty that has been built with hundreds upon hundreds of people inside this, inside this room, sitting right on top of one another. And they are sitting there and they're writing an exam. I'm not too sure what they're doing, but they are. That's what I gathered because they're all writing. It's quiet. They're all sitting packed in like sardines, just writing and writing and writing. And while I'm looking at them, I look at this one man and I think to myself, what are you doing in here? Because I asked the principal what's going on and he said to me, no, this is the grade seven. For those of you who are my age, the equivalent of standard five, the end of primary school. They're writing their primary school final examination. And I said, really, everyone? He said, yes, everyone. This man was writing his primary school examination. He had a dream. He had a dream to fulfill it. And it was able to be fulfilled after running away from a war-torn country to find himself in a refugee camp where he could finally write his primary school final exam. He was in his 60s and he did it. This man, Toussaint Farini, you'll never know him because he's another refugee I met and this is what he told me. Detaining me behind fences while my mind remains free, that's not a prison, but a meditation room. This man achieved his impossible. Why are you not achieving your impossible? You have everything. I think of my grandmother who came to this country with nothing. I look at my helper who's 65 years old and every single morning she packs my children's lunch because I'm working in the morning. She pats them on the back, she hugs them and she kisses them and puts them in the car on the way to school. And she watches them go out and, and get an education. She could never achieve that in apartheid South Africa. Had she been living now, she could achieve that. But the opportunities weren't there. She couldn't achieve her impossible. But she's with me and she dreams about it and she speaks about it with a smile on her face. One final story as I leave you. And it's not all about the difficulties in life because there are simple things we can do to combat what we believe is not bold and brilliant about ourselves. I'd always stood and watched on television the Comrades Marathon. It's a major marathon that everybody here in the country seems to do. And I mean everybody. Have you seen the start line of the Comrades Marathon? For goodness sakes, how many people can run 89 kilometers at one stretch? Now, I said to you a bit earlier, I couldn't run from here to there without wanting to crawl on the floor and die. So I used to take, well, I still do take my son to cricket lessons. And there was this big field with a running track around it. So I had two options. Either I sat and watched him hit a cricket ball for an hour and gain nothing out of it except sore eyes from just looking at my phone and watching him. Or I bring a pair of tackies and I start walking in a circle around the field and walk and run and run and walk and walk and run. And so I thought, you know what, let me try that. Let me try that thing that everyone else is doing. And at the tender age of 43, I decided to put on a pair of tackies and start walking, running around a field and walking and running around a field until, would you believe it? I ran 5Ks without stopping. Look, look at me. I run. I'm a runner. Does that not qualify me as a runner? I ran 10Ks. Yeah. And I leave you with this. My 5Ks is not 89Ks. I don't want to run 89Ks. I'm happy running 5Ks. But I don't look down on you for wanting to do 89Ks. Damn it, look up to me for having run 5Ks. Okay? I am happy with my 5Ks. Look how proud I am. Okay? That's me, and I am proud of myself. 
But what I want you to do, and what I want you to ask yourself, I told you to look at the person next to you a bit earlier, and you realize you're all different. You realize we all have our own dreams and ambitions and our own impossibles. But ask that person, I'm happy with five. How can I help you reach your impossible? It's not that difficult to ask that person, how can I help you achieve your impossible? You'll be amazed how you feel. Thank you.